This is on my bucket list. Skellig Michael, aimed for the Archangel, lies seven miles off the southwestern tip of County Kerry in Ireland. It is about 306 million years old, the island, not the monastery, and is a World Heritage Site, rising to 715 feet at its highest elevation, and you saw it earlier in the other image during the song. This skellig, or slab of steep rock, as it means, is defined by its twin peaks and its intervening valley, which according to Wikipedia is known as Christ's Saddle. You are allowed to tour it and climb 618 steps to visit this well-preserved Gaelic monastery on top where monks kept residence in the 6th century. So it is ancient. In fact, I read that Skellig Michael is so overrun with visitors that Ireland must now concern itself with how to limit access and preserve the site. This, of course, was not the case when the monks of our story inhabited its dome-shaped rock dwellings. Places such as this across Europe were valued for their severe isolation and inaccessibility. The monks were safe from the marauding hordes that swept through Europe at the fall of the Roman Empire. Lorena records in her diary September 13, 1995. What is the part that isolation plays in encouraging some to reach closer to the essence of God? Lorena McKinnon is responsible for today's service. I fell in love with her music from the Book of Secrets. And in it, she traces her Celtic lineage across Europe and Asia, creating the songs to express her story. Along the way, she mentions Thomas Cahill's book, How the Irish Saved Civilization. Sometime later, the author was interviewed on NPR, and a sermon was born. To the Celtic people of Ireland, says my Time Life book, the realm of the supernatural and the natural world were inseparable. Spirits and deities inhabited trees, rocks, rivers, bogs, and mountains, imbuing the countryside with significance. Having visited Ireland, I completely understand. It is a sacred place. But the Celts were not the earliest inhabitants of the Irish landscape. And according to the Oxford Illustrated History of Ireland, they were never more than a dominant minority. Even after Christianity began to sweep the island nation, the Celtic tribal people continued to be influenced by the Neolithic and Bronze Age cultures that had dominated before them, including that magical wizardry of Druids, what we you use would call Earth-centered spirituality. One of the readings that I came across described the Celts as tribes of warrior farmers. Slide 27. I don't, I don't, oh, I'm supposed to be doing it, aren't I? Where are we? Point your pointer this direction. Point it in that direction. Point it here. Wiggle my here. fingers. <laughs> there. Thank you, you do it, and I'll let you know. 
These scattered autonomous clans of warrior farmers were fighting among themselves continually. When Ireland wasn't defending itself from outside attacks, these local chieftains were conducting their own successful raids abroad, especially along the British coast. They are excellent sailors, Thomas Cahill said, and he relates one story I want to share with you. Around the year 401, 401, a giant fleet of these black Celtic ships called coracles, all right, wait on me, <laughs> swept, swept up the coast of Britain and captured thousands of prisoners. One of these, a 16-year-old boy, in slide 29, later wrote about it in his autobiography. He was a Romanized Briton by the name of Patricius Megonis Sucatus, Latin no doubt, from a middle class Catholic family. He suddenly found himself working as a shepherd's slave, the property of a local Irish king. Six years later, Patricius escaped back to Britain, emotionally and spiritually drained by the or ordeal, as you might imagine. PTSD, I would guess. He left the story and returned to Ireland as a missionary, determined to convert those pagans who had held him captive. Have you figured out where this is going? I already saw some hit. As the Time Life book reports, next slide, Patrick's ministry among the Irish was such a remarkable success, the church made him Bishop of Ireland, and later, of course, St. Patrick. Driving out the snakes, you see. There are no snakes in Ireland, thanks to St. Patrick. Now, since I talked about St. Patrick, I ought to mention St. Bridget of Kildare, one of Ireland's only three patron saints. Slide 31. She was a contemporary of Patrick, born in 451. Her namesake was a Celtic goddess, Bridget. Her father was a chieftain, and her mother a slave sold to a druid landowner. She embodies all the Irish elements that I have mentioned. As Ireland's only patroness, patroness, or female saint, she was reportedly great friends with Patrick. Unlike him, she was actually born in Ireland. Many argue she, in fact, deserves a higher status for her miracles and her great accomplishments, feeding the poor and healing the sick. She is remembered for her extraordinary compassion and charity. She was peaceful and conciliatory, where St. Patrick could often be violent. Slide 32. I would like an abundance of peace, yes. According to medieval history, she founded a monastery in Kildare called the Church of the Oak, as well as many other abbeys and an art school. Slide 33. I may be off on my numbers because we dropped one. The church she founded still houses an eternal chalice flame kept lit in her honor. It was just last year that the Irish government recognized her high esteem by declaring her feast day, February 1, a national holiday. Next. St. Bridget. That one I'll have to explain to you, but ask me later. One of her reported miracles. Let me find my way now. 
Uh, so it is a national holiday, and only she and Patrick share that distinction. Ireland, Thomas Cahill wrote, a little island at the edge of Europe that has known neither renaissance nor enlightenment. In some ways, then, a third world country with a stone age culture had a moment of glory. For as the Roman Empire fell, as all through Europe, matted, unwashed barbarians descended from the north upon Roman cities, looting artifacts and burning books, the Irish, who were just learning to read and write, took up the great labor of copying all of Western literature everything they could lay their hands on. So this is the heart of our story today. And it makes for great entertainment. In fact, there is an old movie, slide 35, called The Name of the Rose, starring Sean Connery with a young Christian Slater as his sidekick. It's about the intrigue and corruption and nobility that is all wrapped up in the Irish legacy. Watching it reminded me of the drama that shaped the birth of our own Unitarian and Universalist histories. Through those great debates and heresies and week-long councils, martyrdoms and inquisitions, all going on a few centuries later, over in Transylvania and elsewhere. As Cahill says in How the Irish Saved Civilization, there are no doubt some lessons here for the contemporary reader. He enumerates the maladies of decaying Rome at the time. The emperor's power rested in his role as commander-in-chief an office whose importance over time had been greatly expanded. Taxation had produced a hopeless cast of poverty. The rich became richer as the great landowners ate up the little ones. The bureaucratic establishments had become so top-heavy and entrenched that reform was no longer possible. Any of this ringing a bell? I hear the words too big to fail echoing in my ears. Every time I dig into history, it changes a little bit more my perception of life. It seems that what we actually learn from tragedy is that our foolish and nearsighted humanity has to learn from tragedy. We have to crash the vehicle before we do the safety maintenance. I remember a bridge collapsed in Minneapolis 15 years ago or so. But you can pick any time, any city. What we learned is that reports of fractures and excessive stress ought not be ignored. That strikes me as a spiritual lesson. But is it a lesson if we don't learn from it? After every mass shooting, we talk and pray and light the candles. When Hurricane Katrina wiped out New Orleans in 2005, we learned that it had actually been predicted in a book. Florida schools are being destroyed while funds are drained away for wealthy kids to go to private schools. But wait, wait. This is a happy sermon. The Irish saved civilization. And right up front in Thomas Cahill's book, I found an old familiar quote from theologian Reinhold Niebuhr. Guess what? 
It's even in our hymnal. Number 461. This is what he said. This is our happy message. Nothing that is worth doing can be achieved in our lifetime. Therefore, we must be saved by hope. Nothing which is true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. Therefore, we must be saved by faith. Nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. Therefore, we must be saved by love. Faith, hope, love. The painstaking detail and intricacy of the calligraphy created by those Irish monks is astonishing. They could not possibly complete the task of saving Europe's library in one lifetime. The song we heard, Skellig, was a tale about passing on the legacy from one monk to another. Now take the hourglass and turn it on its head. For when the sands are still, tis then you'll find me dead. Next slide. The Book of Kells is on display at Trinity College in Dublin. It contains the passages of the four New Testament Gospels. The entire four volume digitized set is online. With such incredible artistry in this book, I cannot imagine how a scribe could expect to finish even one chapter. Nothing that is worth doing can be achieved in our lifetime. We must be saved by hope. Next slide. Between the lines in Matthew's Gospel, in the book of Kells, a striped cat watches a rat run off with the communion bread. Lorena McKinnett wrote, the manuscripts tell a lot about the character of their creators. Next slide. Beautiful ornamentation. This is an extreme close-up of something that's on one letter in the book. Next slide. Whimsical doodles in the margins. Next slide. Even Occasional notes, next slide, of a racy or whimsical nature. And you can see all of the little things that appear everywhere in these books. Nothing which is true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. We must be saved by faith. They were doing more than piously inscribing holy books. As Cahill said, they copied everything they could get their hands on. Maybe they were fighting boredom. Maybe some of them were going mad. At the very least, I'm sure there was some OCD. But through it all, in their deep, dark humanity, they met on spiritual common ground to build a shared vision. Nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. We must be saved by love.